was for 20 years the Associate Professor in Clinical Nutrition in, at the Department of Biochemistry and Pediatrics in the University of Ottawa. During that time, he lived in Central Africa, developing training programs that deal with the prevention and treatment of childhood malnutrition. And today, Dr. Patrick comes to us from Ottawa, where he's the president of Augustine College there, which offers an opportunity for students to study the basic foundations of Western intellectual and cultural tradition. Dr. Patrick uh, thinks that the most important thing that most folks want to know is that he's married, one wife, four kids, all married, 20 grandchildren. Will you please uh, help me in welcoming Dr. John Patrick to the stage? Bless you. Let's start with prayer. Father, we know that only as your spirit works in our hearts, our minds, our imaginations can anything of significance happen this morning. So we pray for that enlightenment. And I pray also, Lord, that if anything I say is not from you, it may be swiftly forgotten, but what comes from you may rest in our hearts and minds to burn away until we are obedient. For Christ's sake. Amen. Uh, I've been married for quite a long while. Uh, I have to keep checking every year that it isn't 50 this year. Um, we've been at war the whole time. It's been a good war. <laughs> she still hasn't learned that I'm always right. But, yeah, a good wife is one of the most important things you can have as a man. I hope it's true the other way around. Uh, I'm sure I wouldn't be alive if she'd had the meat cleaver in her hands on various occasions during our marriage when I certainly gave more than enough provocation for justifiable homicide. But uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. The US, Canada, had no development programs. Interesting, isn't it? None. Why? How many of you have read de Tocqueville? That is sadly what I expected the answer to be. Yeah, I would argue there's a book you ought to read if you're interested in how culture develops. It's the best book, in my view, written about why America succeeded. And Americans don't read it. Um, there's a very brief version of the two-volume democracy in America in the, the series, a very brief account of. Uh, the one under Tocqueville is by Mansfield, and it's well worth reading. But de Tocqueville was a, a French aristocrat who had seen the literally bloody mess of the French Revolution, also in the 18th century. And he came to America to see if he could understand why your revolution uh, was successful and created an amazing society. And it's a really important question. He said he did not understand why America succeeded until he went into the churches of America. Similarly, a hundred years or so later when Chesterton visited, he said it in a more Chestertonian fashion, he said, America is a country with the soul of a church. The trouble is, it's no longer true. Uh, sadly, uh, both the Catholics and the Protestants are in trouble. Uh, in different ways. And America will be in trouble because of that. You see, America didn't need development programs because it had agreement about the nature of good and evil. I don't know of any other state, any other nation, that has developed with agreement about the nature of good and evil. It's a very fundamental agreement. You remember, if you look at the old cowboy movies, just to make quite sure you didn't make any mistakes, the good guy wore a white hat and the bad guy wore a black hat. And when the bad guy was caught at the end of his life, he didn't complain and say, my mother beat me. He said, I've lived a bad life and I deserve what I'm getting. That's agreement about the moral nature of society. We don't have it anymore. And even Christians default to the psychology department when they go to university, which is the most dangerous department to go to. The vast majority of professors in that department are atheists. What do you expect them to teach you? And they're talking about behavior. If you start from a wrong premise, you get to a wrong answer. 
And the premise they start from is that you are basically good. Raise your hand if you are good. Oh, one or two people did. Do you mean good in relation to some real standard or good in relation to the people around you? It's the people around you, isn't it? That's moral relativism. The rest of you knew that this was a dangerous question, but you realize you've told me two things about yourself. You can't, it's a very dangerous question because you can't avoid getting trapped. When you sat on your hands and refused to say that you were good, you told me two things about yourself. You told me, first of all, that you have no problem with knowing what good and evil are. You didn't say, I don't know what you're talking about. I love doing this in a place like Harvard. <laughs> Nobody moves. And then I go through this routine. They don't expect lectures to start with questions. You also told me that you're not doing it. Now, if you know what goodness is, and you know what evil is, and yet you cannot do the good, and you could do it, or you're not doing it and you could do it, then you're a charlatan. But if you find that you're incapable of doing it, then you are a slave to your passions. Which is it? And of course it is that we are slaves to our passions, isn't it? What brought me back to faith was Romans 7. The good that I would not, I do not do it. The evil that I would not, I end up doing that all the while. No, we're not irre irretrievably bad. We know good things, we do good things for our children, for others. We are made in the image of God. Thank God we are. Uh, and that helps, but it's not enough. And it's one of the things that we need to realize in the context of the kinds of things that InMed does. You see, there is a real problem here that we need to think about a great deal, and we don't. We go uh, to other parts of the world, and we tend to focus on the things that we can do, and we take them there. Because we have allowed the enemy inside our heads for quite some time. It's been going on at least since the, uh, the early 15th century. So it's a long process. But the enemy is inside all your heads because you think in utilitarian terms. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Even the way we present the gospel is wrong, in my view. And it's a product of what the enemy did to us, uh, beginning with people like Ockham and Descartes and Bacon, all of whom claimed to be Christian. And yet what they did was pull apart what had previously been held together. People who were more straightforwardly honest if you're made in the image of God, God is a totally integrated being. There's no bits that don't fit together. What happened with Occam and Descartes is we started pulling apart what had previously been held together. That's a very bad move. And we've paid the price ever since. And one of the first seminars I want to go to in heaven uh, I have a whole list of seminars I want in heaven, and I don't want them all at once, so I want time to think about them. Uh, but the first one I want to go to is why God allowed four men who believed in him to give us a tacitly atheistic university. The four men, of course, were Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton, all of whom were Christian. Kepler actually wrote prayers in his lab book because he would not have found his laws. Neither would Newton if he had not believed in his God. Kepler actually recalculated the data on the orbit of Mars by hand for five years, Kepler's data, until God showed him what the answer was. Because like everyone else, he was trying to think in perfect circles. And God doesn't like straight lines, and he's not overly fond of perfect circles. Uh, and one day God showed him. It was an ellipse and Kepler's three laws emerged, and the world changed. Newton, as, uh, if he had not had his God, he would not have gone looking for his laws. That's a bottom line, understanding of the world. That's why you can transfer technology to a degree, but you cannot transfer science in the same way. So, but at that time, the church, and the only church there was at the beginning of that period was the Catholic Church, screwed up over Galileo. Now, how many of you know which verse it was that got them into trouble? Raise your hand if you know which verse it was. You could quote the verse that was the heart of the problem with Galileo. 
Again, you don't know. It is very, very dangerous when Christians don't know any intellectual cultural history. Of whom was it said that he knew not Joseph and what was the consequence? Pharaoh, and what was the consequence? Slavery. By the way, that's coming from our missionaries, Paul and Peggy, whose 39th wedding anniversary it is today. Um, quite appropriate, yeah. Peggy in particular should be congratulated for her. <laughs> you can work that one out. Well, the verse was this, the earth is fixed and shall not be moved forever. And at that point, the Catholic Church was as, as literalistic in its reading of the scriptures as some southern evangelicals are today. They were cured of that rather naive reading by the Galileo affair. If you read a poetry book as though it's a physics book, you need to take an elemental course in reading. As Galileo beautifully put it himself, the Bible tells us how to go to heaven. Physics tells us how the heavens go. That is worth thinking about. But nevertheless, it discredited the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, right at the start of the Protestant Church, the devil was in our heads to a degree, and I'll come to that in just a moment. And science, reductive science, which began with Occam and Descartes, was remarkably successful. So the public standing of science went up and up, and the public standing of the church went down and down. And we haven't got over it yet, because we don't know how to talk about it. And hopefully when you go overseas to do development, surely one of the things you want to take to another culture is the mistakes that we made so that they don't have to make them. But we don't do that. I didn't, and I'll talk about that too in a moment. What's my finish time, by the way? I can see the clock up there, I just, what? 10 o'clock, okay, so I'm fine, sort of. I wish I was in Africa, where they tell you, put your watch away, God gave time to Africans. <laughs> and watches to Americans. <laughs> but, within 100 years or so of the death of Newton, the famous conversation between Napoleon and Laplace, who was a practicing Catholic and a reductionist, and Napoleon asked him where God fitted in his science. And Laplace said, so I have no need of the hypothesis of God to do science. Within a hundred years, you went from God-fearing people who started science. It didn't start with endarkenment. I refuse to call it enlightenment. It wasn't. It was an endarkenment. Uh, and it began by the very latest, uh, the middle of the 13th century. And everybody who did science was a Christian and mainly a priest or a bishop. And yet you don't even know their names. You've never heard of Nicola Resme or Jean Buridan or the Merton School people. You should do because they should be our heroes. Our children should know who they are, but they, they don't. When you don't know your heroes, you're in trouble. When you know not Joseph and the king knows not Joseph, you're in trouble. That's where we are. So at about this time, of course, the Protestant church came into being. And one of the things that happens is theology, of course, is not what God does, it's what we do. Theology is our attempt to come to terms with who God is in a way that we can understand. By definition, all theology is reductive. It's less than God, not more than God, isn't it? It's our way of trying to put him in a box that we can handle. And he always escapes, of course. Uh, he's bigger than the box. So uh, theology is useful. It, it helps to track down obvious heresy. But we tend to be too aggressive about it. We tend to believe that we have got it all right. Even sola scriptura, I'm perfectly happy with saying that the scripture is the major source we have of understanding. But of course the early church exploded before anything was written down. That's worth thinking about, isn't it? So how could the early church be sola scriptura? It wasn't, it never is. People who know the scripture best in university are found in the theology department and they don't know Christ. It's important to think about. So our attempt early in the Protestant church was to write a theology that was as tight as science. And it's been a disaster. We are beginning to change. 
because of course uh, the physics that gave you the very tight model broke down too. When quantum physics, the great advance of the 20th century came along, he kind of undermined things somewhat, didn't it? You probably never did any quantum physics, but some things you ought to understand. You can correctly describe quantum physics by saying a single particle can go through two holes simultaneously. Now, obviously, it can't at one level. What it means is that our ways of describing quantum physics in metaphors, particle, holes, are not adequate to what God actually does. The world at the quantum level responds to what you are looking for. Depending upon which detector you put into a system, it can behave as a wave or a particle. Isn't that amazing? As Robert Spitzer, one of my favorite apologists, puts it, he's a quantum physicist, he says there's lots of room for prayer in the quantum world. But there's not lots of room for us being in charge. And that's what we need to learn. Now, I grew up in a Bible-believing home, in a blue-collar environment in Birmingham, in the UK. The British equivalent of Detroit. Uh, in 30 years, the street that I grew up in, three boys went to university. So it wasn't exactly a hotbed of intellectual activity. Um, the first thing you learned in that environment was how to defend yourself. And so I learned that. It turned out, I didn't know it, the only thing I was fit to be was a professor. Uh, who knew that? No one, uh, except God. And I happened uh, to get a scholarship. The meaning of which I had no understanding whatsoever. I was simply told I wasn't going to the local grammar school, high school, I was going to another school. It turned out that that school took 100 boys a year from a population base of 6 million on a competitive basis. Uh, two of those boys had to be from the working class because the socialist local government insisted that that be so since they paid part of the bill for the school. So I was one of two boys who were there because we came from the working class. Everybody else came from academic or professional backgrounds. Bit of a shock for a little boy. Actually, I wasn't shocked at all. I was just amazed and surprised. My first homeroom master spoke five languages. I thought, so this is high school. And it was. It was. What an experience. But it wasn't deeply Christian, although we did begin every day with a chapter of the Bible. Throughout the first 12 years of my education every day was a chapter of the Bible in school. The Brits, you see, were not as stupid as the North Americans. We did not get rid of the Bible for cultural reasons. We always argue on the wrong grounds. You need the Bible because if you don't have the biblical metaphors, you can't understand your own language. That's why every English department worthy of the name has to have a course on the Bible as literature nowadays because otherwise the kids don't understand. This is very true of immigrant groups. And every year, there are more immigrants in, say, medical school than there are in the population because to get here as an immigrant, you must be over, you know, you've got to be determined. So it's a subset, a talented subset. So they're turning up in large numbers in medical school. But they have a huge problem. Uh, they don't understand the language. Oh, yes, they speak English, but many of you don't understand the language either. And I can demonstrate that to you very easily. There's a poem written in the 18th century, which has the line, standing amid the alien corn. Who is it? Raise your hand if you know. One. We won't tell them the answer immediately. I'll test you in just a moment, right? No, I, I'm sure you do know it. But one in, what, 200 people or something like that? That's typical. And yet, you know every word in that sentence. Standing, you know that. Alien, yeah, foreign. Corn, well, it's actually wheat, but that's okay. But who was it? If you don't recognize who it was from the five words, then you miss the point entirely. Of course, it is Ruth. Did you get that? Yeah. You see, Keats, I think it's Keats, when he wrote that poem, knew that his readers in that day would immediately pick up that illusion. So in five words, he has got the picture of an alien, an immigrant, in a strange land, 
who is surviving only because of the very humane leaning laws of the Jews. And standing in the field at the time is Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, the picture of Christ. All that in five words, if you know the language. We don't. That's why you, you don't like Shakespeare. There are at least two or three allusions to the Bible on every page of Shakespeare pretty well. You miss them, you miss the point. I would say that many of you are medical. I often got asked to speak to the students in the first week of medical school because you needed someone who could be vaguely interesting and perhaps even a little bit amusing, and I could do that to a degree. And I would say to the students, you are going to be taught medicine in this medical school on the biopsychosocial model of medicine. We now add spiritual, which means, which means anything but Christian. Um, but it used to be the biopsychosocial. And I say, as far as I'm concerned, that model has been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And my guess is that no more than one of you know what I have just said. And again, raise your hand if you know what I have just said, which means you must recognize the story. This is better, good, at least uh, one percent of you or two percent of you know it. It should be all of you. You do actually know it. It's Belshazzar's feast. Belshazzar had taken the sacred vessels of the Jews and profaned them for an orgy. In the middle of the orgy, the hand starts to write on the wall, many, many tekel you fasten. And, you know, even when you're drunk, hands writing on the wall are disconcerting. So they send for Daniel to tell them what it means. Daniel, of course, was not there. Probably a eunuch, actually. Um, anyway, Daniel comes and says, Be known unto King Belshazzar, the words mean that you and your kingdom have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, and you will be dead and your kingdom will be gone in the morning. We know the date. It happened. I wasn't saying the biopsychosocial model is a few grams underweight, which is what the students thought. And after all, they have plenty of defective professors. They're used to fi fixing that kind of problem. What's the, what am I talking about? No, the biopsychosocial model of medicine is profanely and profoundly inadequate. If you think that you can practice medicine as though the patient has no soul and no spiritual dimension to their lives, you will go nowhere. That's one of the major problems of medicine today. And there isn't a textbook of internal medicine that recognizes the fact that I'm aware of. I have an article coming out in Touchstone in the next few months about this, which I eventually got round. I wrote it about five years ago, and I think my wife sent it off in the end. Uh, but for Paul's age and mine, there's been a huge change in disease in my lifetime. And medicine has made no account of it. And the church needs to take great interest in it. Because when I began in internal medicine in the 1950s, most of the patients that I would see came to me because of what God or nature had done to them. They were not responsible for their illness. Obesity was unknown. Uh, after the Second World War, there was no obesity to speak of in Britain. That's self-indulgence in one form or another, or neurotic problems, or we'll come to some other reasons as well in a moment. Um, even smoking was not wrong in the 1950s. So there was no guilt attached to their disease. Less than 20% had a guilt element in their disease. What percentage of your patients today are guilty of being at least partially responsible for their illness? 70, 80, 90%, depending where you are. Now, if you are sick and suffering because what you have done to yourself and those you say you love are suffering with you, you cannot avoid guilt. It is real. But there is no medicine for guilt. We can suppress it with brain-dissolving drugs, which is all they do, you know, make you incapable of complaining. That's hardly treatment, is it? But there is a solution, but it requires that there be objective moral truth, that you recognize that you've gone against it, which is called sin, and that you repent, and that you seek forgiveness. Only the church can do that. But most of the chaplains you find in hospital are failed pastors. They can't run a church. They think they can run a sick person. No, it's, it's nonsense. The church has to come to life again. You know, it's dead in the water. And even when you go overseas, are you thinking about these kinds of questions? No, you go to teach a new technique in most cases. 
and you go to do public health. Now, there's a problem with public health, which has bothered me for a long while, because I, I've been involved in that area, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But public health is done on communities. You've never met a community, because it has no identity that you can recognize in that way. And the ethics of, of public health are utilitarian. The person who is actually of eternal significance disappears. And the community which doesn't actually exist at all receives the attention. Uh, that's a problem. Whereas medical ethics are deeply rooted in a covenantal relationship with an, a single person made in the image of God. That troubles me a lot. It's troubled me for a long while. I think I know what the solution is because, of course, we didn't have any ethics lectures or anything like that in the past. Uh, you can be thinking about what I think the solution is and we'll get there in a moment. Now, back to my own story to draw you in a little bit. I went off to university to do medical school. It was a very boring experience. I played truant frequently. Uh, I did as much climbing of mountains as I did medical school for at least one year. Uh, but in those days, nobody took attendance, so it didn't matter. I never set a fracture in my life. I knew I was never going to be a carpenter, so I didn't need to do any orthopedics. Uh, I could learn enough from the textbook to pass the exam, and I did that and got away with it. Um, it turned out the only thing I was fit to be was an academic, and that's what I ended up doing. And I became very ambitious. Uh, I loved what I was doing. I was good at it. Um, and so... I went from one specialty to another because they don't allow you to get a permanent position in Britain until you're 30, and I'd taken all the exams by the time I was 26, so I had to fill in, so I went from one specialty to another for a few years, during which time I'd got married. My wife shouldn't have married me, but thank God she did. We'd met when we were both active Christians, and she uh, found me in Oxford when I was just about to lose my way completely. Uh, but then we had children. We weren't going to have children. We were careless, and shortly we had three. Uh, that, that also was a gift from God. And then Sally said, look, you go out in the morning before the children are awake and come back after they're asleep and you see them at the weekend. I want you around more. Can't you do something else for a bit? So I did a PhD to see my children, which is an unusual reason for doing a PhD, but it's a good one, because you can control your hours. And it, it happened to go very well. And when it was over, my wife said, you're not coming back to internal medicine, are you? And it wasn't a question. Uh, can't you find something useful to do with your PhD work? I don't think she had a clue what I was doing, but it happened that I'd been privileged to invent a new technique. And so I went shamelessly through the world literature, looking for an interesting project, preferably in the tropics, because we both wanted to go there. And I found it in severely malnourished children. 10 pound two year olds. And uh, I went to Wellcome Trust and said, here's the problem, here's what I can do, and they paid. The world's greatest employers. For the next six years, I had to write no grants, and I had to write one letter a year of not more than two pages, saying what I'd done the previous year and what I was going to do the next, and they paid the whole tab, the whole thing. That is living in paradise, and it was in Jamaica too. And since nobody else in the world was working on that subject, I had no competition. I didn't have to go to international meetings either. I went to the North Coast to go snorkeling with my children. It was paradise. I was also incredibly successful. Uh, the team that was there had the great privilege of seeing the work that had taken 25 years come to fruition. So shortly before I left Jamaica in 1979, we went through over 100 10-pound two-year-olds in a row without losing a single one of them. We saved every single one. We had done the science. It's very counterintuitive. It's very hard for nice people to do. And I have yet to go to a mission hospital that's doing it properly. That's 30 years later. Um, so we ended up in North America as refugees from Mrs. Thatcher. And uh, I needed them a model, and I found them here, and I settled down in. North America. And I was Christian in the sense that I believed the story was true, but I was not an active Christian. I didn't do Christian things uh, very much, except with my family. 
My family mattered to me. And then God got to work and turned things around in a most amazing way. We did go to church. And uh, one Sunday, a couple of missionaries came. And they were from Zaire, previously the Belgian Congo, now the non-democratic Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and we took them out to lunch. It's very dangerous. Well, we didn't take, we brought them home to lunch. It's very dangerous to allow missionaries into your house. Um, very shortly, they discovered what I knew. And they said, you have to come and help us. And I said, in principle, yes. In practice, under my breath, no. And my wife and kids all said, that's a great idea. You're due a sabbatical. And I had a war on my hands, and I lost. If I'd known what my father told me, just as I was decided I'd lost and we were going to Africa for a year. I called my father in England and said, Dad, are we going to Zaire, what was the Congo, where our friends, uh, the English were missionaries for 30 or 40 years. And my father said, John, I've waited 45 years to hear you say that. Very patient man, my father. My grandfather was a Marxist, and his daughter, my mother, was an unhappy teenager because he wouldn't let her continue her education. He thought academics were a waste of time. So she was learn earning a living as a seamstress in Birmingham. But fortunately, she sat next to a Christian woman who loved her, didn't try to evangelize her, did the right thing, just loved her. And in due course, when she earned her brownie point, she said, we have some interesting missionaries coming to our church this week. Would you like to come? My mother was bored. She said, sure, I'll come. And these were WEC missionaries. They'd never had a salary in their lives. They prayed for everything. My mother had never heard of such a thing coming from the materialistic background she was in. She went back the next night and the next night. She got saved. Now she had someone to write to. And the post got to the Churi Forest in those days. It doesn't anymore. And so they knew when my mother got engaged, when she got married, and when I was conceived. And what my father told me was that from the day those good missionaries heard that I was conceived, they put me on their daily prayer list. They prayed for three hours a day, as you do when you have nothing for certain tomorrow. They prayed that I would become a Christian, that I would become a doctor, and that I would go to the Belgian Congo. No one ever told me until all three were complete. Now, I was not keen to go because I knew that there had been no successful nutrition education programs in sub-Saharan Africa if you put into the evaluation the removal of all expatriate input for three years before you evaluate. What happens to most mission hospitals in Africa when the missionaries leave, Paul? What happens to most of those? Hmm? and then they get run down by nurses, sadly. They don't work. I could take you probably to 25 milling machines within walking distance of the hospital we know best in Central Africa, given by kind-hearted Americans. They never run for more than a year. Maintenance is a Christian idea. There are some systems of belief which are incompatible with science, and one of them is paganism. Don't laugh at paganism. It's a view of the world which is explanatory, and we all need explanatory stories. If half your children die before maturity, your crops fail apparently at random, and you have the worst governments in the world, what evidence is there for a God of love in that story? Not much. But evil spirits make perfect sense. There's a distant God out there, but he sure doesn't care about us. That's the story they inhabit. We all inhabit stories. Our beliefs and our stories don't fit together. That's our problem. How do they come to fit together? Now, I'm leaving all sorts of loose ends. That's inevitable. You can go and find more material on my website and CDs from CMDA and all, all sorts of other places. But I knew that nobody had succeeded with a nutrition education program. So we went because my family wanted to do. I trained my teenagers to resuscitate malnourished children. All my kids had children die in their arms as teenagers, but they saved many more. Uh, and I could measure the decline in the program after eight months of absence. After all, I'm a scientist. I measure things. And I don't do things I know the answer to. I knew that it wouldn't succeed. And this is where everything begins to change. Because I was sitting around not doing enough work to satisfy my activist wife. And she said, what's the matter with you this year? You're not doing anything. I said, I'm not here to run the hospital. 
and I straightened out the pediatric ward, it was back to square one in a year, that's a waste of time, and the nutrition program isn't working except when we're here either. I'm thinking. And she said, looks to me like you're doing nothing. I said, that's what thinking looks like to you, and we had a good old-fashioned family row. Uh, but she won. She said, at least you can do a Bible study for the African graduates who are not doing any work in the village. How many of you have done Bible studies for the people that you visited? A few of you, it needs to be a lot more. And you need to think about it carefully, which ones you do. Now my wife won this round. She said, you should do Deuteronomy because it's interesting. Bruce Walkie had got to me. So I started teaching Deuteronomy to the African graduates in the village. They loved it. We had to go to twice a week very quickly. It was done in my bad French and Sally's excellent French. And then a God thing happened. God sent me a translator who walked a thousand kilometers to get to me and he didn't know why. I haven't got time to fill in that story, but an amazing sort of reminder, a kick in the pants if you like. You're doing what I want you to do at long last. Um, a few weeks later, I ended up teaching 6,000 Africans out of door, Deuteronomy 4, 5 and 6. And if I had a development project for Africa, it would be to give a good commentary on Deuteronomy to every African pastor. The first time I did it, the guy burst into tears. He said, I've never had a book like this in my hands before. Why Deuteronomy? Well, Deuteronomy is needed by evangelicals and by Africans because we make a fatal mistake. We, hopefully, you've all had the experience of God coming into your life, which we then present in propositional terms, which is the enemy in your head, because you can't actually explain your conversion. Uh, and then we proceed to go to church for the rest of our lives, wanting to feel better at the end of the service. We've got those two verbs the wrong way around, feel and think. You don't know, I don't know, exactly how Christ brought me into his kingdom. I can tell you what was happening at the time, but that's not an explanation. I don't know how God does it. It's grace. But once it has been done, and undeniably done, you know that you're different. Your duty now is not to feel good, but to think good. There isn't a single verse in the New Testament that makes you responsible for how you feel. It makes you responsible for what you do with your feelings, but your feelings are not your bailiwick. They're God's. But you are responsible for what you fill your minds with, or what you don't use your mind for. You'll be judged for both of those. And that's what the New Testament is about. So what Moses says to the children of Israel, he says this. He's not going to go into the promised land. So what he's doing, he's giving a commencement address. If you ever have to give a commencement address and you don't know what to do, just plagiarize Moses. It's perfect. Nobody's beaten it. <laughs> Moses says to the children of Israel, you don't even acknowledge what your greatest possession is. In terms of development, what is the greatest position, possession we have as Christians? When you go to do development, what is the greatest thing you bring into that environment? According to Moses. Not doing well on biblical literacy this morning, are we? Do you know that one? Well, it's the law. It's the law. Torah. Why? What's going on? What's Moses saying? He says, well, look, you had an experience of God, the like of which other people are never going to have. God turned up, spoke to you in a voice you understood, accompanied by thunder and lightning and a volcano. Did you have a conversion like that? I don't think so. But they had no free will after that. Nobody was there at, at Sinai could ever deny the existence of God afterwards. That was, you'd have to be stupid to do that. It's not rationally possible. Their free will was taken away. And they said we will obey. And then while Moses was up the mountain, they broke the first three commandments in order. In other words, the experience of God doesn't serve to make you good. The day after you're converted, God can take away destructive habits. And he does that if they're destructive. But you're still the same crabby person you ever were in many respects, aren't you? Uh, we all struggle with the same consequences of our previous behavior for the rest of our life. We are redeemed. But moral consequence is important. So, Moses, so what's the point? If an experience of God like that can't do, what can? Moses said, God said, I have heard what this people said. Oh, that they would have such a heart and mind as this to keep my law, that it might go well with them and their children forever. They didn't do it. Moses tells them what they need to do. 
It's in Deuteronomy 6, the central passage of the Bible for an Orthodox Jew, the Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. How many of you can complete the verse? What does it say? Hmm? I know, I, I know the Hebrew. Oh, yeah, because then the, the rhythm of it is the way you do it. So. But it, it needs to be translated into everyday life. But we'll leave you on one side. Are you Jewish originally? Yeah. Well, all Jews know the words, but they don't understand what's going on. And we'll come to that in a moment. Any of you are not having the gift of being born with Hebrew as a language in your life? Can you complete? What comes next? How many of you are thinking and your neighbor is yourself and knowing it must be wrong because I'm asking you, right? Well, you're right. It is wrong. That's in Leviticus. What's in Deuteronomy is something else you need to teach if you want to do developments. These things, yes? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And these things shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children when you sit at table, when you rise up, when you lay down, when you go on a journey. Not in church, not in the synagogue, but in the domestic environment. The Jews still do this. That's why they succeed. The Sabbath meal matters. They don't understand what's going on. I mean, there you've got Stephen Weinberg, who grew up that way, and he's perhaps one of the greatest cosmologists in the world, and he says, the more I learn, the more pointless it looks. Because he's missed the point. What is the point? Well, Bruce Walke introduced me to thinking about this, and then a year or two later, I was at a conference paired with Bruce Walke, a lovely conference in which they prepared physicians and theologians, and I got paired with Bruce Walke. And I said, they're gonna get him twice this morning, once for real and once plagiarized. But he hadn't thought about it my way. I'm a pediatrician. I love children. I love watching them. Here's an interesting question. Many of you do love children, I know. So what is the difference between the response of an under five and a seven-year-old to the question, would you like a story? And while you're thinking about it, I'll tell you my answer. Watch your faces, and I will know whether you read to children. The seven-year-old will go to her room and bring you the book she's in the middle of and milk you for as many chapters as you will read. But the under five, even in our house, we have 20 grandchildren, they have their bookshelf, and they'll go and get a favorite book. Usually they wisely bring it to their granny, who is very patient, rather than to me, who is not. Uh, but occasionally it's me, and they bring a favorite book. I've read it before, I get bored very quickly, and so I try and shorten it. A lot of you read to children. As one of them said, has granddad forgotten how to read? <laughs> the little brat has brought me a book he knows every word of. <laughs> so why on earth does he want me to read it to him? And this is universal. It's in every culture I visited. Children under five want word perfect stories. What on earth is going on? I think what they're doing is they're trying to find out who they are so that they would live appropriate to the people they are with. And there are really only five major stories in the world. Well, perhaps a few more, six. The major one, of course, is animistic paganism. I don't use that in a pejorative sense, but in a descriptive sense. And that is a story in which the world is explained in terms of evil spirits. And that is still true in Africa, even where people have become Christian. Evil spirits have a much bigger role in their lives than they do in ours. We are returning to that kind of environment in some ways, but we can't actually return for reasons I don't have time to explain. It's only eight minutes left to me. Uh, but it does explain premature death, apparently the random pattern of life. But if you believe that things are created by, uh, are under the control of evil spirits, you will never do science because you can't believe in experiments. Different evil spirits, different outcomes. There's absolutely no reason for a pagan ever to believe that an experiment done in London and one done in Paris would give the same answer. That, that's crazy. Different evil spirits, different outcomes. Even when a machine stops in Central Africa, if you talk carefully to the people, they don't actually believe that it was because they hadn't put oil on the machine. Fundamental cause was an evil spirit. When I'd got my nutrition program going and one of the nurses I'd trained to uh, identify malnourished children had his own child die of malnutrition, that was an insult. And I said to him, why? 
And he told me he wasn't going to tell me the truth by looking at the ground. He said, we didn't feed him properly. I knew he didn't believe that. I sent my supervisor, I said, I want to know what he really believed. And of course, he believed in a more fundamental way than I did that an evil spirit had taken the child's appetite away. So he had done the rational thing from that premise. He had paid the witch doctor to get rid of the evil spirit and the child had died. I said, well, this is easy. I said, if I had fed your child, it would have got better. He said, yes, but you have a stronger spirit. It wasn't my knowledge. It wasn't what I was doing. It was my spirit that was the, the primary thing. Have you thought about that? You bring your techniques in. Technique can be accepted by any society, but understanding is a different matter altogether. Acquiring the technique doesn't give you the knowledge. We're moving totally to technique-dominated societies, even in the way we present the gospel. But understanding, wisdom, where do they come in? They're, they're nowhere to be seen, and that's what society needs. That's what we're short of at the moment. And I could tell you a lot more about that. The next big stories, of course, are East and West. In the West, you have Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And they all have the essential feature of having God separate from his creation. In the East, Hinduism, Buddhism, and their offshoots, God and nature are coextensive. The idea of the fall is also present in the West, not in the same way in the East. So it's not surprising that meditation techniques come from the East. And scientific investigation of nature is possible in the West. Because you read, in, in fact, in the... Uh, the first chapter of the Bible, there's a very interesting thing that only the Jews note, as far as I'm aware, that God, of two acts of creation, does not give the accolade, and it was good, individually. The whole creation gets it, but two things don't get it individually. And I'll leave you to work that one out, and you can come and talk to me if you're lost later in the day. But I leave early this afternoon, so you haven't got long. There are two modern heresies, market capitalism and, uh, and Marxism, both of which are the same heresy. They are both the denial of the fall. There'd be nothing wrong with communism if we were good. It doesn't work because we aren't. The same is true of market capitalism. The meltdown of 2008 was an ethical meltdown. Both the bankers and the invigilators, the government officials, failed in their ethical duty. Uh, and you can't, there's no course which will put ethics into 23-year-olds' minds. That is done before you go to kindergarten, or it's not done. You see, the point about the stories in the Bible is that they are very different from any other set. Think of the history of any other nation. What is the difference between the Jewish history and all the others? Do you have any idea about that one? Hmm? Well, a C word, but not continuity, but consequence. And they tell it like it was. No other national history has the equivalent, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did evil, you know, a dozen times in a row. They don't pretend that their leaders, their heroes, were good people. They were all flawed, but God was reliable. We make our heroes into more than they are, and we rub out the bits we don't want to know about. I mean, what happened in 1812? Americans. Canadians, what happened in 1812? Yeah, and who won? Well, who won in practice? Yeah, Canada. That's why you don't celebrate it. We beat you. <laughs> and it's, yeah, this year is an anniversary. Uh, 200 years. That's typical Western history. We retell the story to suit our own political agendas. It's typical of history everywhere except the Jewish ones. But if you inhabit the stories of the Bible before you understand what they mean, you don't have to, you don't teach early in a child's life meaning, moralistic things. You teach them the stories. They become the grist in the moral bank for making it work later on. A child, a, a girl who knows for such a time as this will know what virtue? See again, it's biblical literacy. It's the story of Esther. If for such a time as this brings the whole story of Esther into your daughter's mind, she cannot not know what courage is. And she'll probably practice it. 
and you know that you can't get away with your sins. That's what you learn from the biblical story. The, the really interesting thing is it's liberals who are saying this. Jürgen Habermas, who's written a, a book with um, Pope Benedict, Jürgen Habermas is a neo-Marxist philosopher from Germany. And in a discussion with Benedict, he said, well, anybody, this is a neo-Marxist, anybody who doesn't acknowledge that our ideas of justice in the Western world come from the Jews, and our ideas of compassion come from the Christians. Anybody who doesn't acknowledge that is simply ignorant. Would you be willing to stand up and say that? There were no hospitals until Christianity came along, and within a few centuries, they were cropping up everywhere. That's development, isn't it? Big time. Uh, but no development program. What was there was the program to witness to what Christ has done and then to build the mind of Christ in the people around. Then you no longer have the clash between utilitarian ethics and covenantal ethics. Covenantal ethics work and they drag along with them the utilities that make life better. When I, and I've done it many times, have put a, no a notion of what community is in place of a person I don't think I was working in God's way. God's kingdom was extended one by one. And it can't be stopped. As the Marxists are finding out, pseudo-Marxists in China. The church does very well when it can't have big programs. And it has to rely on telling the truth of what you have experienced. Um, and that probably means more than anything else talking about your failures rather than your successes. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, judge not that you be not judged and we all stop there, don't we? Church should be non-judgmental, but Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, you hypocrite, why do you want to take a splinter out of your brother's eye when you've got a log in your own eye? First get the log removed from your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. There's a lot of judgment involved there. But it's self-judgment first. When you've been cured of log disease, you can be very useful to people with splinter disease. No pride involved. If you feel inclined to go and help people with problems with which you have never struggled, you better be very certain that God has asked you to do this. He's much more likely to use your sins than your successes. No pride involved and a degree of authenticity that matters. I will not forget the first time I did it. I was asked, as physicians should be asked every year, to teach the youth group on sex and sexually transmitted disease. I refused to call it infection as though we have no responsibility. I did it. At the end, I, my tongue got ahead of my head. And I said, the bottom line is that if you really want to have a successful, happy life in, in terms of sex, uh, you must be chaste before marriage and faithful afterwards. Nobody else comes close. I only wish I'd done it. And then I moved on swiftly. But a couple of weeks later, there was a knock on our door about 9 o'clock at night, and there was the youth pastor's wife, who'd been the only other adult at that meeting. And she said, I've been thinking about what you said, and I think you might be helpful to me. You might not be judgmental. And of course she was having an affair. And we were privileged to help her. She needed help to stop it. She did. She confessed. Her husband forgave her. And as far as I know, they're still in the ministry. And it was that one authentic sentence of truth-telling that made it possible. Uh, truth is our primary virtue. You can divide all the world's cultures into two groups with a single question, which is dominant in this culture, truth or loyalty to the group. Where loyalty to the group dominates, the society is on the way down because you get your job because of who you know. Where truth dominates, you get your job because of what you know. A truth-driven society will always whip a loyalty-driven society. That's why Muslims can't make anything, because they don't have enough communal truth-telling to make big institutions work. They are rife with corruption. We are going in that direction, as is obvious. And Christians will be forced to work out within the context of your own churches 
what things you cannot trust the state to do. And you need to be able to talk about these things when you go overseas. If you've never read Leslie Newbegin's Pluralism and the Gospel, read it before you next go. Thank you for listening because you are. That's amazing at this time of the morning. Well done. how you transition out of that or away from that. I've been working on it for five minutes. I have no clue. Just to say, we're going to leave now. Um, we're going to break up into the regional health group sessions. If you'll look, that's the next thing on your agenda. It's on the back page of your conference brochure. And there you will find a listing of folks who have done ministry in different parts of the world that are there ready to be interviewed by you to share their sins and hopefully God's successes. Um, sorry? Yes? Okay, and if you would like to stay with Dr. Patrick, he had a special session that was devoted more towards students, is going to be question and answer driven, which most of these sessions should be question and answer driven. The um, lectures will give a little bit of information, but they're there to serve you. So 